Hi guys, welcome back to the Carla Garrick Show. Today we're kicking off part three of the series from the apartheid state to the free state. You'll recall in part one and part two, we covered a bit of my personal history, the history of the free state, the history of South Africa. I mean, we've, we've been sort of all over the place. But in today's uh, episode, which is episode 25, we will uh, we'll be picking up from the cliffhanger we had last time, which was, tell me a little bit more about your husband. Subtext being, this gentleman must be kind of crazy to hang out with you, Carla. Uh, so you'll learn a little bit about Louis, uh, about our relationship, and uh, you know how I reclaimed my health, why I'm involved with the Free State Project, what we're hoping to accomplish here, and more. So I hope you will enjoy this episode 25, the final in the three-part series, From the Apartheid State to the Free State. If you'd like to give me feedback, let me know how I'm doing, you can email me at Carla at CarlaGarrick.com. I'd love to hear from you. But in the meanwhile, I hope you enjoy this, the final in the three-part series. And remember, folks, together we can live free and thrive. Take care now. Was your husband? Yeah, I was just talking to a friend of mine who I, I've known for a long time, and, and he was kind of a kind of a fuck up when when I knew him when he was younger. He got married a couple years ago, and and they're expecting their first kid now. And he was, we, we were having this kind of conversation about how you know he was telling me how when you're married and you have that person who you knows with you, and you you have your lives intertwined. He's like you, he's like I both feel this responsibility that I need to take myself and my life seriously for her. But I also feel this sense of comfort that I know she's here to back me up. And, and it kind of changed his perspective on, on how he views himself and his own confidence and what he wants out of life and what he thinks he can get out of life. And so it was, it was really interesting hearing him talk about how having that partner and, and what that strength has given him. And I think that's something that we, we really kind of underplay in, in mm. modern society is having that, that person with you to go through life. Your husband seems like he must've been, he must just be so game to go with you. I, you, you met in, in South Africa, right? He's yeah. Not, and so to come with you to America, to Silicon Valley, and then to go backpacking with you for three years and then to say, Hey, yeah, let's go to New Hampshire. I, what kind of person and personality is he? And, and, and did you have to do any convincing of him to, to make any of these steps? So uh, he's amazing. Uh, we've been married 27 years now. So wow. you know, um, and people ask that question. Uh, he he's more of an introvert. He's obviously he's a tech nerd. So that's sort of you know we know that flavor of guy. Uh, he's an incredible shot. Pew pew. Yeah. Uh, people always mention that. that. I was like, oh, yeah. I didn't know that was your thing, honey. <laughs> Um, but he's also very adventurous. I mean, the initial decision to leave, uh, you know, I, I think maybe initially I just shocked him where I was like, babe, I love you, but like, I'm going to America. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to come, let's do it. And then I think by, you know, I was young at the time. I, I, we were tw 21, 22. He's a little older. So he was like 27. But we always said to each other, it's an adventure. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And I think by setting that sort of expectation for our relationship to just kind of say, this is our adventure together and giving ourselves that breathing room, it just always worked. And I think it's because I took the pressure off my crazy brain to say that it has to be perfect right it was just like okay look this is an adventure if and it works it works and if it doesn't it doesn't and then it worked because we you know we just we get each other and he has a really great sense of adventure he's very smart like i think i'm smart but he's like ways well okay we're gonna edit that part out yeah, he doesn't <laughs> have to hear that <laughs> i was gonna say he's way smarter don't let him ever watch this <laughs> um and uh, he's a big reader too. You know, we're kind of nerds, to be honest. We just, you know, um, and so he actually helped me move towards like a healthier lifestyle. Like I was definitely, um, you know, partying a little too hard, definitely drinking too much. My diet wasn't good. I had a very adverse reaction to a vaccine actually at City College. This is a bit of a segue. But when when we were leaving New York to come to New Hampshire, I had finished my degree and I went to the and I had avoided getting a, a second or a third MMR vax, but it was required 
to go to city college, but I just avoided it for like three years. And then I was like, whew, I'm done. And then when I went to get it, they looked at the computer and they're like, no, this says you never showed us proof of MMR vaccination. And I was like, yeah, but like, we're done. No one got measles, mumps or rubella while I was in school. I didn't give it to anyone. We're good, right? And they were like, nope, we have a box to check. You have to get it. And Causation is not correlation. Correlation is not causation. I get it. But I will tell you this. I never had allergies in my life. I had never had any kind of autoimmune responses to anything. I started getting arthritis. I gained like 50 pounds. I was uh, allergic to basically the entire, like, I mean, New Hampshire is just trees, like, right. you know, <laughs> so I was allergic to New Hampshire. And so I had to really reclaim my health. Um, and Louis was really instrumental in that and just sort of leading by example. He was like, look, I'm gonna start eating this way. You do what you, you know, if you want your hamburgers and your pizza, that's on you, but I'm gonna eat mostly, you know, l uh, medium protein, high good fats and low carb. And then I started to see his success and I was like, yeah, maybe I should give this a shot. And, and I did, and, you know, I'm really glad I did because health is time and health man that's what we got right like we're this unit and you're gonna go through this lifespan and you may as well make it as awesome and as fruitful and as exciting and as healthy as possible because if you have your health nothing feels impossible yeah and if you need an example of, of government screwing something up, like you look at the food pyramid. I mean, they were telling us, even as recently as when I was in school, you need right. 11 servings of grains, of, you know, eat your white bread. And so many people have kind of on their own had to figure out, oh, no, actually, if I'm better in protein and I'm better in fat, which right. again, they told us fat was the most evil Bad. in the world. And, and now everyone's learning, oh, I feel so much better if I'm eating high fat, high healthy fat high protein and minimizing carbs and yeah it's and it's incredible. it's shocking i mean i you know because of this last year it's that that tension where people are like listen to the scientists listen to the experts and you're like why would right. anyone listen to these right. people they're wrong about everything right. including the food pyramid and sadly this virus has pretty much targeted type two diabetes people who are eating the wrong thing. You can reverse type two diabetes if you get people eating the right food. There are many documentaries and books and things out there now. And then of course it's it, it has hit the obese incredibly hard, right? And so you're like, well, they kind of created these people through the food pyramid. And now, you know, now there's this, I, I won't go into my weird theories about where it came from, but let, you know, so, so, but there is this disease. We, we said, we said is, enough that YouTube's got, got plenty of reasons to pull this episode. So yeah, uh, we don't have to get into every single one. No, no, I no. got my first episode pulled. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still waiting on it. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Okay, I will say thank all you. I the words. appreciate your help. <laughs> so, oh. So I want to I want to ask. So you you weren't just any regular member of the Free State Project. You you were in leadership roles. I forget your exact titles. I know you. I think you were the organizer of Pork Fest, like you said, for a couple of years. And I forget. I don't know if you were executive director. I forget the, your, your title. But can you explain kind of how you worked your way up to the kind of the the hierarchy of of the Free State Project and and what that was like? Yeah, sure. So you know, there's a famous saying: "No good deed goes unpunished." So I did a good job with Pork Fest the first year, and then um, and I'm sorry, I, we I, don't, I don't think we define Pork Fest. Right? Yeah, pork you're Fest right. Was, so yeah. the Porcupine Freedom Festival, which will have its 19th version wow. next year, it'll be so June cool. 20th through the 26th at Rogers Campground, and tickets are on sale now at Pork Fest. P O R C fest.com forward slash tickets, I think, but uh, pork fest because of the porcupine. So the porcupine is our mascot. Why is it our mascot? Because porcupines are peaceful creatures, but you don't want to mess with them, right? They will only defensively use their quills, but they will use them if you come at them, right? And so I feel like that pretty much uh, sort of represents our, our ethos, right? Like we're, you know, we're all people who, who believe leave us alone. And if you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone and fine. Right. Uh, so I did pork fest a couple of times and then I became the uh, president actually of the free state project. And I, uh, I, 
it was basically the ED. We changed the titles now. And I did that for five years. So my piece de resistance was, um, I'm a like fan girl of Edward Snowden. Like I have a lot of admiration for people who, um, who do brave things for the better of society and who suffer consequences, right? Like I'm pretty sure Ed does not want to be sitting in Russia. You know what I mean? Um, so when when all that whistleblowing stuff was happening, I, I I've always at our conferences, whether it's Liberty Forum, which is our you know winter conference, or Pork Fest, which is a summer one, I've always tried to give a platform to people who who are doing those brave things, right? And um, and so in 2016, when we triggered the move, which is just basically, we had said there are 20,000 people need to pledge that they're all going to move together, and if we do that, then uh, then the time starts to move and then people would have five years to move. So we've moved beyond that whole model. No one's counting anything anymore. It's a real movement. Like we don't need that. Right. And so in 2016 on uh, what is now known as Porcupine Day, when we got our 20,000th, which is the hardest word to say, um, signer, uh, we had Liberty Forum, and actually Edward Snowden uh, messaged in from Russia. It was the first uh, conference that he had done, I think, since he had left. I remember I did the press release, and we sent it out, and it was picked up by like 140 newspapers in America. It was like front page news. Like, Edward Snowden is going to do this little conference with these crazy people in New Hampshire. And it was, uh, and it was a huge success. And, um, and that's, you know, more or less when I stepped down and then I really needed to take some time. I think one of the things that happened for me personally was I got thrust into a very public role that I wasn't really equipped to process yet. And I will tell you a couple of things. Libertarians are not nice people sometimes, right? But the enemies of libertarians are way, way worse. And so I didn't really, I hadn't developed the skills to just kind of be like, you know, and this was like right when social media was becoming. So I was just getting like, you know, hammered and I didn't have the skills or maybe even the confidence or whatever that thing is to, to deal with it. So one of the ways I was coping is I was just drinking a lot. <laughs> and so after, you know, I mean, it's shocking to me if you look at the videos from, from when we announced it, you know, I'm, I'm 50, 60 pounds heavier. I, you know, it's just, it's not good. It's hard to look at, but you know, that's a reality. And then you look at something and you go, do I like this? Do I want this? Or should I maybe make some changes? Right. Which is, how life gets better for folks. And so um, I do like to always say this because, you know, you don't want to be too told you so. But had people bought Bitcoin on Porcupine Day in 2016, if you had bought $100 worth of Bitcoin back then, you would have had $8,000 at the last Pork Fest. And so I like to say that because, you know, people aren't sure who to listen to or like who's right or, you know, people call us names. And so people are like, oh, should we Maybe I, you know, maybe those people are, you know, uh, but then I'm like, no, like all I'm trying to do is actually improve your life. Right. So th there are a group of people who are saying you can be a self-actualized human being. You need to like set and meet goals. You need to like figure your crap out. Um, and then there's this other body of people who everyone's listening to who are like, you're useless. You're a victim. You can't do anything. You suck. You can't like make, you know, and I'm like, why would you want to listen to those people who are literally telling you you're worthless yeah. instead of going, you are super, super, super unique and important. And let me help you or let society or let, you know, all the gurus out there and like all the self-help books, like find out what that kernel is yeah. and go find it and be your best you. Yeah. And th yeah, that's why, you know, I never mock, you know, you'll see people mock like Anthony Robbins or any of these self-help people. And I think, why would you ever mock someone if, if that person's helping someone improve yeah. their lives? I don't care how they're doing it. If, if someone's making their life better, great. That person's a hero for helping that other person. And right. And I would much rather, 
Yeah, people should, um, again, you know, I know it sounds like a shtick, but I'm like, we only got one life, right. as far as I know, you know, and if that's the case, let's let's make it count and let's, you know, I don't want people to suffer. And if we're going to move into this sort of model of a medical tourney and, you know, where we're going to start hurting people or putting them in different groups. I mean, I heard today that a hospital in Colorado took anyone who was unvaccinated off their organ recipient list. And, you know, and I'm just like, look, this is this is not good. No, and it, it, you're, you're right. And especially after this, you know, this year and a half that we've had, like there's it feels like humanity is being sucked from us. You know, it, it's it, you, you, for a while you couldn't even go outside and hug your neighbor. I mean, it, and and that's yeah. There's I just saw this clip post the other day. I'm a UFC fan. There was a UFC fight a couple of weeks ago between Nick Diaz and Robbie Lawler, two kind of UFC veterans, and and you know they it was a, a tough fight. I mean, they're both bleeding at the end, and you see them come up and hug each other, and and you can hear the audio of, of Robbie Lawler talking to Nick Diaz, and he's like he's like, "Are you good, man? Are you good?" and and Nick Diaz goes, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. And, and Robbie Waller goes, no, are you good in life? And Nick Aww. Diaz, Nick Diaz goes, oh, that's you know, he goes, that's another fucking story, man. And you, <laughs> they're having like it's like this intimate conversation, but you can hear the camera's just right. barely picking up the audio. And and Robbie Waller goes, hey, I want to help you, man. Let me know how I can help you. And you, just, it, was, it was just this intimate, mm. touching moment that like that I, I've been talking about this clip for for a week now since I first saw because for some about it touched me to my core, and it might just be because. It feels like there's so many fewer moments of that type of humanity in, in our day-to-day -day lives that when you see it, it's something special. Yeah, and I think we can all do with a little more compassion and love. I was just at a uh, health freedom rally on Saturday, and they had called me before the time, and they're like, Carla, can you bring the ray of sunshine? And I was like, <laughs> damn it, now I'm going to have to rewrite that yep. screw everyone speech, <laughs> yeah. right? But I was like, okay, I can. And the way I sort of framed it for people there is we have to realize – um, from a neurological perspective, right, things have been happening. And this 24-7 nonstop propaganda has actually engaged people's amygdala, which is where your, fa your fear, where the fear factor sits, right, um, in a way that can change your neural programming. So an example I use is in the Second World War with the, the air raid sirens, right? So people would know an airplane's going to come and they're going to drop bombs on London. So they would set off the sirens and people would go into bunkers, right? Your adrenaline would spike, your cortisol would go, but it would pass. And then you would come up. And not that I'm saying that that was like a peachy world to, you know, be hanging out in, but it would pass. But what we did for the past 18 months with, you know, legacy news and propaganda and that kind of stuff is they set off that air raid, air raid siren and they never turned it off. So they took these people and it was like, and they put this frequency into them that I think has, you know, I'm not a, a medical expert, this is just a lot of reading, but like they, I think they're making people a little crazy and it's not on accident and scared people are controllable people, they are obedient people and they don't question things. And so I think, you know, regardless of, you know, where you fall on the spectrum of what exactly is happening, we do know it wasn't nearly as bad as people said it was going to be, and that all these strange things have happened that have more to do with population control and, uh, you know, monitoring people and watching our movement and to bring it full circle back to apartheid South Africa, right? The papers, please, where the police on the street literally would tell black people, show me your papers. And if you didn't have the right paper to be there, you would get arrested and be thrown in some jail where sometimes you'd be in jail for like three years. I had a client once who was 15 when he got arrested for a murder that he did not do. I became his lawyer when his dad came to me when he was 18 and the kid had never even had one day in court to get out or get in. So what happens when the Leviathan, when the, the beast becomes this big thing, right? Like we all just get caught up in it. And I want to tell people, let's not get caught up in it. Let's you know, bring the rays of sunshine back. Let's realize that a lot of these people are just, they're, they're hurt, they're scared. They don't really know what's going on. And to tell them they're dumb and stupid and, and like all of that is not going to help. We actually have to fix it through through love yeah. through saying to people compassion 
empathy. I hear where you're coming from. What about this? And just really like open it up. Everyone is spreading hate. And I think some of us really just have to start to spread some love. Yeah, and that's what people are attracted to. And that's I, I think you're right. And I think sometimes people feel like, well, I, I can't fight if I'm not angry. I have to be angry to be able to, to fight the good fight. And and no, that's not true. There, there you can be the happy warrior. I mean, that's what I loved about Ron Paul. I mean, Ron Paul's really kind of how I first got into oh, all of this. And and nice. it, it was just this kind of this folksy country doctor. And he's he's saying these tough things and he's going after Rudy Giuliani and he's going after the 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 military industrial complex. And but it, but he's just he's doing it. In a way, you're like, I, this is like my grandpa. Like he's, he's, he's just seems like a sweet guy saying these really tough things. And I, I think that's the way you, you attract people to what you're doing. No matter what you're doing, it doesn't have to be politics or activism. I think it's, it's anything in life. Yeah, I fully agree. And, you know, Ron Paul is a, a, a gateway drug for a lot of people. Uh, I know with Lou and I went to a, oh, God, it was somewhere in Texas. And it was uh, the guy who wrote The Lonesome Dub. He just passed away, Larry McMurtry. And it was a retreat that he paid. And this was in 2007, late 2007. It was the one year I missed Pork Fest. And we were there. And I remember it was like 14 of us. And we were handpicked. And, you know, and I was I was Ron Paul all the way in, you know, everyone else is like City College, you know, sure, like sure. Bernie level. Right. I mean, he wasn't running it. He may have been running, actually. Anyway, and, and Lou will always say to me, I just remember, like, they were all sitting on one side of the room and I was on my own. And he was like, you just wouldn't give up. You'd just yeah. be like, no. And I was like, well, you know, I got you and I have another friend who's who's kind of she's come over a little bit, too. So you never know. Yeah. You just have to be open to talking to people, bring a good, healthy energy. You know, I, I can get angry and I do get angry sometimes, but I've learned over time, you know, we can we can accomplish more if we're likable and if we can communicate clearly and um, and just again, show those people some compassion because assuming, uh, you know, that there are gonna be some medical issues and some autoimmune diseases and just some troubling things that are gonna come out of this, um, you know, to, to I, they've put us in a really difficult spot for me because I'm like, I, you want to do that? I told you so thing, but you're like you're talking to people who can't reverse decisions that they may have made, and so we have to really navigate that as well. I think in a sensitive way, and and allow people to be like everyone gets to make their own choice, but maybe someone you know, made a, a, what turns out to be not the best choice for them for their health or whatever. But the more people we can get thinking about how do I make my body healthier, even like me where I had an adverse reaction, but now I've actually managed to bring all my autoimmune issues under control. And that's through making the right choices. Yeah. So, you know, love, compassion, make the right choices and get enough sleep. Yeah, that's, yeah, sleep's my big one. Oh, yeah. And I, you know, you brought up Bitcoin. This is talking about making smart decisions. So the first time I heard about Bitcoin, every libertarian has this story too. The first time I heard about Bitcoin, because I heard about it my first, uh, first time I was even around a group of libertarians. It's like my, I was doing a college internship in, in 2011. And so this is very, very early on in Bitcoin. And I hear these guys sitting around talking about this thing called Bitcoin. It's this online currency. And I'm just thinking, I'm thinking this is Dungeons and Dragons kind of thing. I'm thinking they're yep. playing some sort of video game. And, and I laughed it off. But yeah, back then, if you had put ten dollars into Bitcoin, it'd be ten million dollars at this point. Something crazy like that. So, smart decisions is is absolutely the key. Yeah, but, and oh, go sorry. ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I, I wasn't gonna say. I, I was gonna change the subject. No, go ahead. No, you change the subject. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, basically, I just wanted to ask you, just wrap it up here. What's the current state of the Free State Project? What are you guys working on now? What's what are your future plans? Yeah, so the Free State Project's doing like gangbusters. It's crazy. I, I manage one of the pages. It's the FSP job alert. So where we really try and help match people with jobs and that kind of stuff. And I let 52 people in yesterday. That was just like one day. Um, we have our winter events coming up in March, and that's Liberty Forum. And people can find information at nhlibertyforum.com, uh, I believe. It may be dark. Org. We obviously have Pork Fest coming up next year. That'll be in June. Um, I'm going to go down to Florida to do Tom Woods' 2000th episode, go hang out with that crew a little bit. But really what we're trying to do is to encourage 
movers to uh, use the fsp.org forward slash visit and fill out a form and really just come, right? We have a monthly calendar, which is fsp.org forward slash calendar. And people are just genuinely shocked when they open it up and they're like, wow, there are literally hundreds of events a month, right? We have three community centers with a fourth one coming in. Uh, that's places where we meet up. People do things from play Dungeons and Dragons to have like a homeschooling craft class, uh, really just the gamut of whatever people are interested in. And because we're very uh, human action directed, everyone's doing like little projects. So, you know, some person will be like, oh, you know, we have a poker group and we have a hiking group and all of that, right? So we're just a very large community that has many different interests. And we just want people to come visit, come when it's convenient for you. Right now it's beautiful foliage season so you know anyone who feels inspired after this to just hop in the car come on out um and then we just you know we're always looking for volunteers we're always looking for donors um i would love to see anyone who's doing conferences that have anything to do with freedom liberty bitcoin crypto uh health all of that, New Hampshire's number one industry is tourism. We have beautiful resorts here. Plan your events here. Why don't we just all leverage that energy, right? We could do a crypto conference at Bretton Woods. Oh, that'd be funny. Oh, that would be so funny. <laughs> I pitched that to Hereticon. Oh. oh, that's funny. I'd love that idea. Well, that's great. Well, Carla Garrick, I could talk to you all day. This this has been excellent. The The book is The Ecstatic Pessimist. You can get it everywhere. I will link to this in the show notes. I will link to the Free State Project in the show notes. Uh, Carla, this, this is awesome. Thanks so much. Thank for you. What a pleasure. Me. I appreciate right. your time.